All right. Uh, well, thanks very much. It's uh, a pleasure to be here, uh, part of this event. And, um, and I'm, I'm certainly hoping uh, to continue on the themes from this morning. I think one of the themes of the event today more broadly, which this certainly fits into our session on social networks, is how data technology and computation are really helping us reconceptualize and reshape fundamental structures uh, in society and the economy. And social networks are certainly a case where this has had a, a profound effect on the, on the domain. So in my own comments, I'll focus mainly on, on, on the online world, on online social networks, and really how they've changed some of the aspects that we associate with offline social interaction. Um, in a way, when they first became widespread, social networks sort of lit up a part of the world that had been sort of dark to researchers, namely the ephemeral nature of our uh, social interactions, right? With great effort, social scientists had done very deep work on, on these kinds of interactions, but suddenly with this with this data simply spilling out of social media systems like Facebook and Twitter, we could ask these questions at much, much greater scales. And then the challenge became really to reconcile these two kinds of methodologies, the big data computational one with the deep nuanced questions of the social sciences. But like many of the domains we saw this morning also, I think, uh, online social networks weren't just representations, sort of inert sources of data for the offline world. They quickly became complex engineered environments, blending our social interactions with a kind of algorithmic backdrop. Uh, and because they're engineered, right, because they're ultimately algorithmically uh, managed and designed, it's reasonable to ask, what is the function of an online social network? What are they doing, right? And it's a reasonable question to ask, and a non-obvious one, because we often think of them just as places where we kind of spend time, we consume content, we, you know, interact with, with, with our friends, you know, in, in shorthand, places where sometimes we just think we're, we're just wasting time here. But in fact, they've really radically changed uh, the way in which we interact with information and other people in, I would argue, some profound ways. So when we ask the question, what is the function of an online social network, really from this level of functionality, I would argue there are at least two truly new, new things that, that they've, they've brought us. I'll certainly point out uh, two here. The first is that they serve as a fundamental new kind of transport mechanism for information, opinions, and behaviors. Now, social networks have always served this purpose in, in the offline world. But the growth in online social interaction has really made this effect much more powerful and non-local. It's also sort of a profound change in how we think about consuming information on, on, on the internet, right? I mean, there's always been a tension on the internet and the web between the act of you seeking out information through things like search and the act of information seeking you out. And really, social networks have very much added to that latter development, right? The sense in which you can sit in one place, the information comes to you curated, filtered, and shared by your friends who have found things to tell you. Now, if we want to understand it as a transport mechanism, then we need to understand how that, how that kind of transport works, right? What is the actual mechanism? And one thing that social scientists have suggested that we think about is the question of how you respond to the activities of of your neighbors in the network, right? If, it, if it's your neighbors that are sharing this information and these opinions and these new behaviors, what is your probability of adopting them as a function of what they're doing? And the mathematical social sciences dating back to the 1970s and earlier suggest that we actually sort of conceptually think of, of a curve on x and y axes. On the x axis is how many of your friends you see doing something, and on the y axis is your probability of uptake. And what's interesting is that if you go back to papers from the 1970s, you can see Mark Granovetter's cartoon sketch of what one of these curves might look like. Uh, you can see Thomas Schelling's uh, actually concurrent cartoon sketch of what one of these curves might look like in, in, the, in the economics literature. Right? And I'll emphasize that these things are hand-drawn. Right? They're sort of conjectures as to how you might respond to seeing one friend do something, or two friends, or three friends, and so forth. Now, even in 1999, as the internet was going full speed, we never really imagined we'd have enough data to really build one of these, right? These were really conjectural, they were thought experiments. Uh, and so there's something sort of magical about the fact that when social media began to gather force in the 2004, 2006 era, you could really start to build real curves, right? And so a number of us started to create these things around 2006, looking at, say, you're probably of joining a group in an online community. You're probably of accepting a product recommendation, right? And the curves actually let us get at something that had been conjectural for a long time and was suddenly measurable. But of course, once you're able to do that, you can ask much more subtle questions. Uh, there are many of them. I'll just mention two. Um, one, a very nice study by Eitan Bakshi and his colleagues at Facebook randomized this process. They actually varied the number of friends that you showed to someone, right? Say you have three friends doing something, uh, but I'm going to show you either one, two, or three, and you can look at the effect of how salient I make that number of friends. Or some work that Johan Ugander, Cameron Marlowe, Lars Backstrom, and I did uh, looking at how those friends are connected, 
Right? And we found, for example, that when you receive an invitation from a disconnected set of three friends, uh, it can be more than twice as powerful as receiving that same invitation from three connected friends. Right? It can, the topology can also matter. OK, so the point is there are many rich questions that, that we can ask here if we want to understand these things as a transport mechanism. But there's a second, perhaps more subtle thing that these networks have been doing. And that's really providing us with kind of computational and algorithmic assistance for maintaining our social ties. Right, so some of you may have visualized your own personal net network in social media. This is an example. This is a picture of a network neighborhood of a Facebook user, um, actually an engineer who worked at Facebook. And all of our network's neighborhoods sort of look like this. Right? Arrayed around the outside are all the friends with connections between them. Um, and you see the dense clusters with strong ties denoting close friendships inside. And then you see weak ties right, that potentially reach between clusters. And sociologists tell us that different things happen on these kinds of ties. Right? The strong ties densely embedded in clusters uh, facilitate trust. Right? They're where sensitive information can be shared without as much fear of repercussions. Weak ties are associated with less trust, but in a way they're the backbone of the transport mechanism. Because in a sense, the very uncertainty about who's at the other end of a weak tie is what makes it so valuable as a conduit for novel information. Now, of course, this strong and weak distinction is something that, that we see in the sociology literature. Once you start working with the data, you understand that there's a rich multiplicity of types of links. And so, for example, uh, just to take one, Lars Baxter and I became interested in people like that, that node you see in the picture at kind of 7 o'clock on the clock face, right? that node with all those things reading out. That turns out to be the user's spouse. Right? And there's a network signature that stands out very, very strongly. Uh, and we took this and we began to develop work on identifying the network signature for things like spouses, family members, uh, this, this sort of very, very close relationship, which actually deviates from the standard highly clustered uh, picture of what these things often look like. So the point is, Facebook is helping us maintain all of these ties, perhaps the weak ones in particular, right? Because in the offline world, for people of my generation, there was sort of an energy gap, right? You had to either maintain a tie at a certain level of activity, or it essentially went to zero. And this is why people from my generation lost touch with many of the people they went to high school or elementary school with. And something has changed there, because Facebook is different. Facebook doesn't have that minimum energy gap. It can maintain ultra-weak ties forever, right? assisted by algorithms, assisted by newsfeed rankings, and so forth. So I want to talk in the final uh, three minutes here about a way in which we tried to put some of these ideas together recently and look at something at the mesoscale, not the level of Facebook, uh, but the level of an organization. Uh, and how transport of information and strength of ties helps us try to look at what's going on. And this is some recent work that I did with Daniel Romero and Brian Utzi, looking at the communication network within an organization, in particular uh, a, a, a hedge fund. Um, the point is, the interesting thing about a hedge fund is that, like everything, it's subjected to external shocks. But those external shocks are particularly salient. Right? We can look at how did the communication within the organization, right, the flow of information on these strong and weak ties, change as the environment was changing. Right? as, say, prices change, the prices of the stocks that they were trading. Now, what was interesting is that if you looked at uh, just the raw message data, you might say, let's make sure there's something really going on in their communication when the price changes. And there certainly is. Let's see if we can advance that. There we go. Um, so here are some plots. Uh, X-axis is what the stock price was doing of the stock that they were talking about in their messages. Zero is at the midpoint. So negative is to the left, positive is to the right. And using some simple measures of emotion carrying words, you can see that actually things are being very, very strongly reflected in the content of their messages. Right? So when prices are going down on the left, you have negative emotion, you have anger, anxiety, words associated with all these things. Uh, on the right, as the prices are going up, um, you have positive emotion words. Um, and one can do much more sophisticated analysis. This was essentially our calibration to say, is there something going on in the network? Actually, it was a little surprising to us, and many people in the audience may understand this better than I do. But it's not a given that the trader is losing money when the price change is negative, yet certainly the language was somehow conveying the negativity and positivity. Something interesting to ask there, I think. But what was interesting to us, having calibrated it on the language, is that the network was reacting to shocks in a very similar way. What was happening? So you can do the same thing with network measures. right? So we see the price changes, positive or negative, and we look at what's happening to the network on which they're communicating. You might have imagined that when the price changed dramatically, people would actually use weak ties more. right? The use of weak ties might increase as traders activated these weak ties to seek out novel information to respond to new circumstances. But in fact, just the opposite happened. The network closed up, right? it sort of turtled up, and you saw much more communication on the strong ties, the familiar relationships, the 
communication within the firm, lots of dense clusters, as people essentially fell back on what was familiar in the presence of uh, unknown conditions. Right? Whether this was the right strategy or the wrong strategy is, of course, a fascinating question that we're thinking about. But it certainly is clearly what was happening. So all of these findings uh, suggest ways in which we can think about these networks. But what I want to just leave you with as a kind of summary is really these two fundamental ways in which online communication and social networks, I think, are changing things. One, in reshaping the flow of information. And two, more subtly, in changing the way we can maintain our social ties, potentially even the, over the course of, of our lifetimes. Uh, and how we can use that actually as a lens, not just at the Facebook scale, but at the level of organizations and, and how they react. So I hope that as we think about you know, shocks to the electoral system and to the financial system and to the power grid and many of the other great topics here, we'll give some thought to the things that go on in so social networks as well. Because the growth of data and computation technology, I think, is really radically changing how we experience information and the connections we all have to one another. Thanks very much.